Well, good morning again, everyone. (coughs) You know, Christ came at a very dark time in history, and we could certainly use a visitation today. It's very dark spiritually in the world today. Need a fresh visitation from the Lord. And Lord, we do thank you for your presence. We do pray that you will speak through your word and convict our hearts and feed us with the food that is necessary for us. In Jesus' name. And before I get going, you know, thinking of Christ feeding the, the multitudes, 5,000, 4,000, another case, he set them in companies, 50s and 100s. And, you know, I just want to say this. You don't have to understand everything that's being said. But there is something for every group in the church, even young people. There will be something that speaks to your heart. There are things you don't understand, but there's always something that clicks and you get. And so we want the Lord to speak to our hearts. Amen? So being that we're now in the advent of the Christmas season, I thought I should begin to share a little bit of the, the Christmas story. And actually, there's only one Sunday left till Christmas. It seems as though we only share certain parts of Scripture on special occasions. You know, we don't talk about the, the shepherds keeping watch over their flocks, in July, you know, we, we can only uh, speak certain parts of the scripture, it seems, on special occasions. But the message that Christmas brings is, the overall message is the message of redemption. God, the Son, becomes a man for the purpose of redeeming man, to reconcile mankind to God the Father. And that was the ultimate mission of Christ upon earth, to reconcile mankind through the work of the cross. He's going to become the peace offering, and he's taking all of the judgment that we deserve upon himself and thus making peace with God for us. So we can have peace through what Christ did in his visitation to earth. Amen? We're justified through that act that he fulfilled for us. But this morning, we're going to consider the birthplace of Christ. And this birthplace was prophesied in the book of Micah. Micah the prophet prophesied of where the Messiah would be born 700 years before he was born. And this prophecy is quite revealing because it, it reveals the deity of this one who was going to be born, that he wasn't just a person. This is God in the flesh. This is God who becomes man. We know that God had to become man in order to to die because God can't die, so he had to put on flesh and blood. But looking at Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, going back 700 years before Christ, it says... uh, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be a ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. This one that was going to be born was from everlasting. His existence has been from the beginning. It's amazing how the rabbis never took careful note of some of these sayings. And the next verse is also quite interesting, too, because it tells us that Israel is going to be written off as a nation until the end of the church age, until the church travails at the end of the age, and then they're going to receive their Messiah. But in a very revealing verse, we don't want to get into that now. But Bethlehem, though small... And insignificant was the birthplace of the two most important kings of Israel, which were David and Christ. So let's consider some of the facts here concerning the birthplace. In Luke's gospel, Bethlehem is referred to as the city of David. 
And it's interesting because this is the only place that Bethlehem is referred to as the city of David. Later on, well, they say later on, but the Old Testament refers to Jerusalem as the city of David 44 times, but only twice in the New Testament is Bethlehem called the city of David. This is where David was born, and later, of course, he reigns in Jerusalem. It becomes the city of David. But in Luke's Gospel, in chapter 2 and verse 4, only twice in the New Testament is Bethlehem called the city of David. It says, And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Christ had to come through that genealogy. He had to be born through that bloodline. And also in that same chapter in verse 11, to 11, it says, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So only twice is Bethlehem mentioned as the city of David. Forty-four times Jerusalem is mentioned as the city of David. So when David became king of Hebron and then later king over all of Israel, he... Um, he took Jerusalem and it became the city of David. He took it from the Jebusites and David reigned from Jerusalem. You see that in 2 Samuel 5, verse 7. We're not turning there, but if you wanted a reference on that. And so in similar fashion, Christ was born in Bethlehem and yet he was rejected as their king. But he shall reign as the king of kings from Jerusalem in the next dispensation, the millennium which, by the way, is not that far off. Essentially, if the types are correct, there's about 2,000 years given to the church age. So if we go the full 2,000 years, we're looking at about 10 years left to this dispensation. And Christ returns, and he shall reign upon earth, and he shall reign from Jerusalem, as David did. And chapter 14 of Zechariah actually gives us a picture of Christ second coming and reigning from Jerusalem. But just looking at verse 9 of Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9, it says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. Shall there be one Lord and his name one. And he shall be the king of kings. He's coming again and he shall reign from the city of David, which is Jerusalem. And incidentally, David will also be a prince in the millennium. He will have a throne in Jerusalem at the same time, both Christ and David. David, of course, is resurrected as well. And we could look at that if you'd like to post that verse from Hosea 3.5. Hosea 3.5. And referring to the dispensation that's coming, it says... Uh, Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Seek the Lord and David their king. And of course, this is written long after David. So we find striking parallels between the first God-appointed king, which was David. You know, Saul was man-appointed. David was the chosen one of the Lord. And the king of kings, and Jesus, the king. Now, uh, Christ was of the physical line of David through Mary. Of course, the father had nothing to do with it because the inception came from heaven. But Mary was offspring of David. And we find her genealogy in Luke 3. So uh, she goes back to David. But then, of course, it was the male's genealogy that gave throne rights. If there had been a throne at the time of Christ, there was no throne that had ended you know, four, over 400 years earlier, but had there been a throne, Christ could have proved that he had the throne rights through his father's genealogy, his earthly father, which was Joseph, 
And we find that genealogy in Matthew. You could go right back to David and prove that he could have been the king. If there had been a king at the time, David could have proved his genealogy. Amen? <laughs> so, uh, anyway, um, some of the parallels between David and Christ. David was a shepherd. Christ was the good shepherd. In John 10, David was a prophet. In 2 Samuel 23, 2, Christ was the prophet. Mentioned in Deuteronomy and also John, I'm sorry, in John 7, 40. David was a king. Christ was a king as well, though not recognized. He was the king. He was in command over everything. And David even touched the priestly ministry, which was not according to order. Um, when he went up on Mount Zion, uh, he experienced the Melchizedek order, which was king and priest. And those two were, lines were not to mix, but Christ fulfilled the kingly and the priestly role. As a king, he had command over everything, didn't he? He had command over the elements, commanded the wind, the waves. He said, no man takes my life, I lay it down. He was in total command of every situation. He was king of kings. And as a priest, he was going to offer up himself. Right? He was a king, and he was a priest. And as we mentioned earlier, both David and Christ are going to reign during the millennium. Okay, let's go back to old little town of Bethlehem. And Bethlehem was about six miles from Jerusalem. I've been to Bethlehem before. Um, it's kind of a, well, how can we put it? It's pretty much taken over by the Palestinians or the Philistines and it's not the greatest place to, to live today. A lot of Israeli soldiers there in Bethlehem. In fact, I had my picture taken with a couple of Israeli soldiers there in, in Bethlehem. But um, Bethlehem means, what does it mean? What does, what does it mean? House of bread, that's correct. So it, it is only fitting that the bread of life should come from the house of bread. And that was the ministry of Christ. He was going to become bread, spiritually, to the nations. So let's talk about this a little bit. I mean, the miracles that Christ performed, feeding 5,000 people with a basket of food, and then coming up with 12 baskets of leftovers, but uh, the feeding of the thousands of people was only symbolic of a much more uh, greater truth. Because, as Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of, a man, out of the mouth of God shall man live. And the natural bread was only symbolic of the spiritual bread. We can't live without bread naturally, food. And spiritually, we can't live without the bread of life. I mean, he is the only way that we can live forever, and that's by partaking of, of Christ. So Christ fed the multitudes, the basket, all kinds of leftovers after he got through feeding them, and which tells us that Christ is able to feed the whole world naturally speaking, spiritually speaking. And when you stop and think about it, there are millions of believers today, and we all draw our strength from one source, don't we? All of us. We all feed off one individual who came down from heaven. He's in us, but we draw our strength from his word by his spirit. We're all drawing our sustenance from one being the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen?
I live, I draw my strength, I'm energized through the life of one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Israel could not comprehend the spiritual implications of what Jesus taught. Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part, you have no life in you. Well, that turned off a lot of, of even his disciples. In fact, many of his disciples turned back at that point. You find that in John 6, 6, 6. It's an interesting verse for people who turn back. But let's read a few verses in John chapter 6, because he is the bread that came out of Bethlehem. And there's quite a, a dialogue going on here in this chapter, um, but we'll try to make it concise as possible. And the Jews begin here in John 6, 31. John 6, 31. And they're saying, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Verse 34, Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And once again, the Jews Spiritual understanding was pretty dull. They only understood the, the temporal. Uh, you know, they never could understand the spiritual implications of anything. And so, oh yes, oh yes, give us this bed, bread. You know, they're thinking of the kind that you know fills your stomach. Um, but Jesus continues here in verse thirty-five. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And dropping down to verse 48, 648, I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. You can see how he's turning off the Jews because they had no spiritual understanding. In fact, it was kind of a curse that God gave them eyes that could not see because they would reject even if they heard. But And verse 52, the Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And so by the end of this dialogue, many of Jesus' followers turned back. They abandoned ship. Uh, he said some hard things. They didn't understand it. They went back to John 6, 6, 6. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And then Jesus said unto the twelve, will ye also go away? See, the Jews could not understand the spiritual implications of feeding from the bread that came down from heaven of one divine being. And here is the word that became flesh. The word became flesh. And as we feed upon the word, it becomes flesh in us. It becomes substance in us. So what does it mean to feed upon the one who came down from heaven? Well, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, there are probably recent statistics 500 million evangelicals on the face of the earth. Probably more than that because there's a lot of places where people can't say, hey, I'm a Christian. But anyway, there's at least 500 million evangelicals, people that are claim the born again experience. And all of these evangelical Christians every day feed off one person. Don't you? Every day. We draw our strength from the word of God. For by his spirit, we're energized. We're all drawing our source from one person. We need strength, oh God, in Jesus' name. We need grace. Lord, I can't get through this without grace. We're crying out to Christ, the one that was sent from heaven. 
I need wisdom. We're crying out to God for Christ. We can all be doing it at the same time, too, all 500 million, and we're drawing from him. I need protection. I need help. I'm in trouble. I need sustenance. I need provision. And so here are 500 million people at the same time, and they're all drawing. They're all being fed from one being, the one who came down from heaven. Amen? From one source. We're all feeding on the living word. We're all energized by his spirit within, quickened. As Jesus said in John 6, 63, talking about the bread that came from Bethlehem. 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and their life. And you find so often in scripture where God's people are feeding off the word. That's their diet. Um, let's just bring up Jeremiah 15 for a minute. 15, 16. And you find this repeated many times in scripture. I'm just giving a sample, but Jeremiah says in 15, 16, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord of God of hosts. Jeremiah, he's eating the word. It's so sweet to taste. But then later it becomes bitter. Because he's experiencing some of the life of Christ. Some of the rejection. He finds himself in prison and in the pit. And being persecuted because he's experiencing the book. He's eating the book. And so you see other places, uh, you know, the psalmist and so on is talking about his words, how sweet they are to our taste and uh, so on. So he feeds us, he nourishes us through his word, by his spirit. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that quickened word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, we are encouraged to study the logo. You know what the logo is? It's the, it's the written word. So we, every day we study the logos, the logos of the word. We're just reading along. And then suddenly, something stands out to you and it quickens. That's the rhema. That's the word we're to live by. The word that God speaks to us. Something in that word will speak to you. Do you believe that? If you are faithful about looking into the word, something says speaks to you every day. That's your food for the day. That's your thought for the day. That's your energizing factor. There's something in that word that is going to quicken to you. You know, the Corinthians, they were, they were carnal. And Paul says, I fed you with milk, but not with meat because you aren't able to bear it. But listen, we want to, we want to be strengthened uh, by the meat of the word. Amen? I mean, babes feed on milk. That's the elementary principles. But if we're going to mature into the life of Christ, then we have to feed upon the deeper things of God. Feeding upon Christ. So, in short, we have to feed upon the life of Christ. Years ago, going back early 70s, I remember reading a portion of Luke, Luke 4, and where Jesus is preaching in his hometown, he's teaching in his hometown, and he's saying something that is totally turning off, you know, the elders of the city. And I just want to look at that for a minute because it's so quickened to me. And looking at Luke 4, and I've been in Nazareth too, it's kind of a, 
you've ever been in Scranton, it kind of looks like Scranton, PA, because it's got real steep streets. And I mean, if you picture the place where I grew up, I mean, if you saw it today, you know, there's mosques there, there's McDonald's there, you know, it's, it's not the idyllic, none of those places are the idyllic place that you picture, you know, from scripture. Um, but um, in Luke 4.25, Jesus is saying this to his hometown folk. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta in Lebanon, city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And, you know, the elders of Nazareth, they violently reacted to this because what he was saying was that, you know, many widows, many hungry, but the one who got fed was somebody outside the kingdom. Then he goes on to say, many lepers in Israel during the time of Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian who was outside the kingdom. And the, the elders, you know, they rose up and took him up on one of the brows, uh, the brow was actually quite a few cliffs right above Nazareth. They took him up there to shove him off, but he passed through them, he made himself third dimensional. But my heart cry was, Lord, if there's nobody else that wants to get fed, I do. If there's nobody else that wants to get cleansed, I do. And I think that should be our attitude. Lord, uh, I want to be fed. Lord, I want to be cleansed. I want to be different. Amen? And I think God honored, you know, those prayers that I made back in those days. But we want to feed upon the life of Christ, the bread that came from Bethlehem, and it takes a certain spiritual hunger. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Let's look at another portion here. We're jumping ahead now to the third year of Jesus' ministry, and he's preaching during the Feast of Tabernacles in John chapter 7. And in this portion, he's preaching with such power and such an anointing and doing miracles there that many recognize him as the prophet that Moses prophesied of, Deuteronomy 18:18. 18, 18. And the religious people, they saw how the crowd was being swayed, and they wanted to take him. They sent temple guards to arrest him, but they couldn't touch him. He was so anointed. And even the guards were taken back by the words of Christ. They couldn't touch him. It wasn't his time. And so Jesus had just spoken about rivers flowing from our innermost being. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And there was such a gush of the Spirit that the people said, this is the prophet, this is he who came, this is the prophet. And in verse 40, 740, uh, many of the people, therefore, when they heard the saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. And others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So here was a big, the big question. We know this man. He's from Nazareth. He's up in Galilee. And Christ is supposed to be born in Bethlehem in Judea. Of course, they didn't know the backdrop of the story either, did they? That Christ was born in Bethlehem and he must have been in the area for about 40 days before they went to Egypt. But... Uh, that was the big question. Hey, if the Messiah is coming, he's supposed to come from Bethlehem. This guy is from Galilee. And so, um, I mean, they couldn't have known the backdrop of, of his birth. But it's, it's interesting, too, because Galilee had some interesting prophecies as well. In fact, we're not looking at it, but in chapter 9 of Isaiah and verse 1 and 2, 
talks about the people that sat in darkness in Galilee, the nations that were round about Galilee, have seen a great light. The people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. And that's reiterated again in Matthew 4, that those in Galilee, they saw a light. There was a light in Galilee, which was Christ. That's Matthew 4, 14 through 16, if you need it. And so, again, in John 7, 43, and there was a division among the people because of him, because of his birth question. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. They couldn't touch Jesus. The anointing was too strong. And it wasn't his time. In fact, timing is a big thing in the last days. I think... uh, in John's Gospel, there's at least four phrases that says, um, because his time was not yet come. And they couldn't touch him until that time. And Jesus was careful about his walk because he was very conscious about timing. But then finally, when he comes to the Last Supper, it says he knew his time was come. But Uh, Timing, I think, is going to be a a very crucial thing in the last days for God's people because people can go before their time. You don't want to do that. Um, But they couldn't touch Jesus. And so there's a big debate here. So who stood up for Jesus in the council? Well, there's only two people mentioned that ever stood up in the council took the counterpart and resisted what the council wanted to do. And one of them was Nicodemus. You know, he was on the council. And also Joseph of Arimathea. It's it's kind of an interesting story here. Uh, My brother Paul, you know, he spends a lot of time in Indonesia, but he was ministering to the Indonesian parliament and uh, which is mainly Muslim but they accept Christ as a prophet and so anyway he was using a few illustrations of the council and how that only two stood up on the council to say what was right they I mean it, it was unpopular listen Folks, in this life, sometimes to be right means you're going to be unpopular. Isn't that right? When you stand up and say what's right, it goes against everybody else. But especially when you're in leadership, you have to stand up for the right. There was only two people on the council. There were 70 in the council. Two of them that actually stood up in the defense of Christ. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. But here in verse 50, we're in 7, John 7, 50. And we're coming down towards the close, so be encouraged. Um, John 7, 50. Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night being one of them, being uh, the council, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what it to it, what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went unto his own house. So that was a big debate there. If he was really the Christ, he would have come from Bethlehem. But this man came from Galilee. But of course we know that where he really came from, he did come from Bethlehem. Well, just to make a personal application and then closing up here, it was God's purpose for his people to become bread to the nations. And in the symbolism of the tabernacle, there was a table with 12 cakes that represented the 12 tribes. And that was God's purpose for Israel, that they become bread to the nation. Did they fulfill it? No, 
We want to feed upon God's word. You know, Job said that. We, in order to, to be bread, we have to feed upon the bread. In order to uh, quench the thirst of others, we have to drink of him. Amen? Before we can feed others, we have to feed upon Christ. Before we can satisfy the thirst in others, we have to drink of Christ. Job said um, that he esteemed the words of his mouth more than his necessary food. That's Job 23.12. Or as Ezra said in Psalm 119, thy words were sweet to my taste. The word becomes flesh as we experience it. We pass through certain things in life. And as we're passing through these experiences, all of a sudden the word opens up to us. And we can only understand the word as we're passing through certain experiences. Are you with me here? Sometimes people say to me, I don't know how you ever came up with that verse. You know, some obscure verse, but, you know, when you pass through certain things, God opens up his scripture to you. You have to be in the night to understand, you know, some of the things that you find in the dark. Um, you know, the treasures of darkness, you have to pass through darkness to get some of the treasures, right? I wrote a commentary years ago on the Corinthian church. Now, what ever inspired me to write a commentary on the Corinthian church? Well, I'll tell you what inspired me. By being in a Corinthian church for four and a half years, I was inspired because I saw the Corinthian church unfolding before my eyes in this place. You were there too, there, Daniel. You were in this place. So. Um, but I saw, I saw what Paul was contending with, what he was dealing with, with the carnal Corinthians. And so by the end of my sojourn there in this place, uh, I understood the Corinthian epistles. So it kind of provoked me to write a commentary on the Corinthian church. So the word becomes flesh in us as we experience the word. And there is a process of becoming bread, and we don't have time to go into that, but there's a growing process, there's a cutting down process, there's a milling process. Christ was being milled from age 12 to 30. He went through everything that you can go through. But he could understand all the perplexities and all the difficulties, all of the temptations that mankind goes through, yet not yielding to any of them. See, we can feed others by virtue of passing through certain things in this life ourselves. I mean, you want counsel from somebody, you want counsel from somebody who's passed through things and, and can tell you something. Well, we want to feed upon the bread from Bethlehem. We want to drink of his spirit because as we drink of him, then from out of our being, he said, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. As the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers. We have to drink of him before that water can gush forth of us. We have to feed of Christ before we can feed others. We have to feed upon the living bread. Amen. You understand why Christ came down as the bread from heaven, born in Bethlehem.